Now we have uh, Matt Shirk with Idaho National Laboratory. He's a research en engineer and going to give us an overview. I, I like this title, <laughs> what's new and what's next for, for fast charging. So um, I, I believe his presentation is about 20 minutes and then we'll do 10 minutes Q and A. Um, and so as he's speaking, go ahead and put some questions into the chat box um, and then we'll just do all of the questions at the, at the end. Um, and it's a fairly small group, so you can unmute yourself and ask questions too towards the end. But I'll hand it over to you now, Matt. Sounds good. Thanks, Alicia. So uh, <clears throat> thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, vehicle fast charging, what's new and what's next. And by that, really just talk about the state of the art, uh, where things are now, and talk a little bit about the R&D that is being, that's going on at INL and elsewhere to address some of the barriers to better, faster, uh, more ubiquitous uh, fast charging. So kind of the, <clears throat> an overview of, of fast charging, you know, one of the big primary goals is to make um, EVs uh, able to make long trips beyond their um, single charge range and adding miles to um, back to, back into the vehicle battery during recharging, uh, coming close to what we're used to when using a liquid fuel to refuel uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle is is kind of the goal. It's what people are used to, and it really could aid in um, in EV adoption. And um, <clears throat> more more than just convenience, it of course gives you uh, saves a lot of time if you're traveling beyond the range of your vehicle. And um, so one of the metrics that is really talked about a lot is miles of range charge per minute. Um, and there's looking at a few of the kind of standard power levels you see out there, 50 kilowatts, which is kind of like the old um, peak power that some of the early EVs like the Nissan Leaf would charge at, up to 350 kilowatts, which is generally touted as a extreme fast charging, more and more of the exotics and things right now. And if you consider a car, um, kind of your average EV, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 watt hours per mile, more or less depending on conditions. Um, if you take that math and figure out how fast you're replacing the energy, which is just the, the power, um, a 50 kilowatt charging station could replenish 15 miles every minute that it's charging at 50 kW. Um, and the 350 kilowatt station could do of course, um, much more than that, 105 miles every minute, which that would be great, right? Because then we could get what we're used to as a, as a tank of fuel in three or four minutes. But um, when we think about this mile per minute thing, um, rarely do we really get that kind of um, charge replenishment back in the pack. So I borrowed a figure here from, um, from a blog, an EV blog, Inside EVs. And here, somebody took data from a Tesla Model 3 a long range all wheel drive. And they were charging at one of the new higher powered Tesla charging stations, so 250 kilowatts. So that's a lot of power, right? That's um, 75 miles of range every minute. But um, if you look at this red line, you can see that it kind of ramps up in the beginning. And then after it hits about 10% state of charge, it, um, let's see if I can use the pointer here. You know, it comes up to this, this, this flat uh, plateau at about 250 kilowatts for just a few minutes of time, and then it tapers off. And that's nothing wrong with um, the system. It's just, a, it's just the way that batteries are able to accept the, uh, these very high power levels. This is a very high um, powered fast charge. And so <clears throat> this is true of most vehicles. They charge at uh, their peak power for a fraction of the time that they're connected and we rarely see it maintained very long over the entire charge. And so even if you see um, like these kind of peak numbers, the vehicle might be able to accept uh, up to that, but generally for short periods of time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, some of the challenges that they face with making a better batteries to help that out. So, um, Looking at some of the different dispensers as well, there are three pretty common ones right now. Uh, the one that we may have been familiar with first was called Chatamo, and that's what 
is on like Nissan Leaf um, and some other vehicles. And uh, this latest generation is rated up to 500 volts and 400 amps, but generally it's less because it doesn't use a cooled cable. And I'll talk more about that as well. But um, the one of the newer, it's not very new anymore, but a newer one is the SAE uh, combined charging system. And so on the top left corner, you can see what the um, <clears throat> dispenser handle looks like for that. And if you look at the ABB charger with the red light, you can see the CCS on the left and the uh, CHAdeMO on the right. This dispenser is set up to be able to offer both, um, both types of charging. And the uh, CHAdeMO has a, a much heavier cable. And that is, is actually not because it can push more power. It can actually do less power. It's just the fact that uh, that one doesn't utilize liquid cooling in there. And so one thing that <clears throat> the charging station the extreme fast charging station manufacturers have come up with is putting cooling in the cable. So the entire length of the dispenser cable has cooling lines wrapped um, in and around the current conductors. So the current conductors can push more current and maintain uh, safe and comfortable temperatures for an operator. It also keeps the handle cooled. Now on the lower left, there's a picture of the, uh, the actual pins of that uh, charging handle. You can see the big power pins and their um, associated copper lugs in the back or brass lugs. <clears throat> and those are meant to take heat away from the actual connection as well. And um, another ubiquitous type is the Tesla supercharger, probably the biggest or at least the most noticeable charging net, fast charging network we see out there along the interstates uh, largely. Um, and those are commonly 150 or 250 kilowatts. Uh, those voltage and current limits aren't totally clear because it's not um, based on a publicly available standard, but um, the Tesla superchargers are um, just an, another very high powered uh, charging station available to light duty vehicles. <clears throat> so if we look at increasing from the 50 kilowatt charging level up to um, beyond 350 kilowatts, there's this one megawatt notion as well. And the boxes are just kind of showing graphically how um, graphically how many times more uh, power can be delivered beyond a 50 kilowatt station. So 50 kilowatts per box. That one megawatt station, of course, is, is 20 times or like 20 50 kilowatt DC fast chargers. And so the 50 through 350 kilowatt is what's envisioned um, in the near near future for light duty EVs. So <clears throat> with some of your older EVs charging at 50 kilowatts and some of your newer ones, um, the newer, more common, um, more attainably priced vehicles are reaching up towards 150 kilowatts. And then we generally see the exotics in terms of light duty cars um, charging at higher powers um, beyond 200, 250, even up close to 350 kilowatts. And then in the one megawatt space, that's really um, seen as enabling fast charging of heavy duty vehicles because higher power charging and fast charging aren't necessarily the same thing. It's really a function of how much power are you putting into um, the battery relative to its size. And so a one megawatt uh, charger might not be able to charge a heavy truck any faster than a 150 kilowatt station could charge a car, but it scales up you know, proportionally to the size of the battery pack. And um, these one megawatt charging stations, um, I'll have a little bit more info on the consortium that's putting together or, or planning out the uh, standardization of these megawatt plus charging stations. So now talking a little bit about the R&D, um, I'll go through some information on battery packs. I'll talk a little bit about the charging station, um, cable and connector, or sometimes lack of cable and connector. And then a little bit of economics facing station operators, just one element. And then a little bit about um, the security of the fast charging infrastructure. So vehicle batteries um, are obviously there to store the energy required to drive. And once they're empty, we need to charge them back up. So improving the fast charge acceptance um, by the battery is one key to faster charging. So I guess that seems kind of obvious, but even with all of this high power charging infrastructure out there, we need to have cars that can 
reliably um, charge using fast charging um, without damage, right? And that's something that the manufacturers make sure of and factor that into their warranty and things. But we know that um, <clears throat> through research that high rates can cause damaging stress stresses and it can accelerate electrochemical reactions that can degrade the batteries. So, um, and also the fast charging can cause the bat will cause the battery to heat and they must be cooled or they'll begin to charge more slowly as well. And um, a constant current, constant voltage type charge. Now this is something that's transparent to, you know, the user, the vehicle and the charger work together to handle the charge within the parameters that the vehicle allows. And, um, but constant current, constant voltage is one common charging algorithm among many. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about why the uh, chargers don't charge at peak power for very long and why the power tends to fall off uh, once the battery gets higher in its state of charge. And so um, here for, for a single cell in the lab, we charged at, uh, we tried, we did trials charging the cell at several different C rates. And the C rate is really, um, it's, it's one over the uh, time that it takes to charge a battery. So one C would be charging in one hour, two C would be charging at a current to recharge the battery fully in a half an hour. Um, in 5C, one-fifth of an hour, and so on. And so um, the, the power being shown in the left figure, you can see it peaks and then it drops off relatively quickly towards zero. And if we could maintain that power for a longer time, we'd, we'd increase the, the speed at which the vehicle could remain, re, uh, replenish mileage um, to then be able to go travel. And so the reason that is, is because the cell's voltage will come up and there's a window where the cell um, remains safe and won't degrade. And we can't go beyond that. And so due to the chemistry and the internal characteristics of the, the way the cell is designed, that voltage comes up and then we maintain that voltage and the current tapers off and thus the power tapers off. And so really that um, that's shown here on the left but on the right, what's more important is you can see the capacity coming up of that battery. Um, that really, you can really see how increasing the, the, the C rate from one through five increases the slope of that line. So we're recharging more capacity in less time, but we get more of a knee compared to the green line, the one C line. And so this is pretty good. We can still charge the battery up to, you know, maybe, 80 or 90% in, in 15 minutes um, at that high rate. So this is a cell that's actually designed pretty well for high power, but uh, this is one that wouldn't necessarily, necessarily last. Um, so even though it can accept it, it needs to be able to do so many times. And those are some of the other um, challenges that are being addressed through uh, battery cell R&D. Um, a little bit about the connector and cable. Those connectors and cables have power limits, uh, mostly due to the charge current. Of course, the, they have to be insulated to be safe at high voltages as well. But the, the, uh, the heaviness and the thickness of the cable are largely dictated by that current carrying capacity. So these extreme fast charging stations, 350 kilowatt stations, um, can charge up to 500 amps using liquid cooled cables. If we didn't cool that cable, it would be so bulky that um, few of us would really be able to comfortably um, take that from the charger and plug it in. And so you can see on the picture on the right, you can see that the top right, you can see the red um, band and that shows the way that the, uh, the conductor in this thermal image, you can see where the conductor is, is uh, throwing off heat and spirally wound uh, through the cable. And then in the lower picture, you can see the charge dispenser. Um, it's not operating at high temperatures in this case, we can see what areas have um, higher temperatures compared to the ambient areas. So <clears throat> I talked about the heavy duty, the heavy duty vehicles. And in this case, if they're looking at this megawatt charging solution, um, that is a standard being developed by a Charin for class six, seven and eight medium duty and heavy duty trucks. And that proposes even higher voltage beyond 1000 volts, 1000 amps, uh, with cooling on both the cable and vehicle inlet and the, and the uh, connector on the EVSC. And so 
even these uh, cool cables can have limited duty cycle. So the ones that we've been testing in charge of their peak currents only for a matter of um, minutes before they have to dial back a little bit. Now that's fine with the current, the current generation of vehicles where they can only charge at the peak rates for a matter of minutes. But um, for the next gen vehicles, they'll probably need to add some refrigeration um, beyond just rejecting heat. Um, they're gonna have to actively cool it with like a refrigeration type system. And then there's your non plug and cord solutions. And that can really help because in this case, an operator doesn't even have to pick up the charge connector. And that can be done by wireless charging or overhead systems uh, for buses or other commercial vehicles that charge frequently at the same location. So um, from, for the wireless charging, there's a picture here from the company Wave who um, has been doing um, DOE R&D on a product for medium duty heavy vehicles. And um, <clears throat> this, this can work really well when vehicles have defined stops on regular routes and it can increase the duty cycle of the vehicle because um, rather than having to return to the depot to recharge, they can be recharged at intermittent breaks uh, throughout the day. And that, can, that high power can be paired with high power accepting batteries that may not provide a long range, but they can be recharged frequently throughout the route. And for these stations, several hundreds of kilowatts of power transfer have been demonstrated and it removes the constraints of the connector size, weight, and cable management. Some of the major areas of development are safety, including electric and magnetic fields, um, and, and efficiency across the air gap. Uh, I talked a little bit about the, the economics, and one big factor can be power demand, uh, charges that come from the utility, and power demand charged by the utility is certainly, um, it's passing on costs that the utility incurs. Um, sometimes there's talk that this is like um, a, a non-necessary penalty, but really uh, the utility has to do a much more robust build out than they would need to for high powered peaky loads than they would for um, a flatter, more, more consistent load. And so we, we see um, demand charges in terms of dollars per kilowatt of power um, each month. And so for, for a 15 minute power um, excursion, high power excursion, we're going to both of course pay for the energy throughout the month, but even that single 15 minute excursion will incur a demand charge. So down below I have a, um, an image showing uh, a simulated charging station, multi-dispenser high powered charging station. And here we're looking at peak powers of 1.6 megawatts. And um, the red line there is the 15 minute peak um, that would be incurred by the utility. And we're talking 10, often 10 or tens of dollars uh, per kilowatt. So and that's on a monthly basis. So that can be a very large bill. Um, in a perfect world, we could flatten that out to the yellow line, which is the mean power. And then it would just be a consistent load uh, drawing the same uh, power all the time. That would be really ideal for the utility, right? Because they would always expect it and know um, they could have the most minimalized infrastructure to deliver that to the customer. But of course, in the real world, um, we may be able to um, smooth that out somewhere between the, the worst case uncontrolled um, case and the, and the unrealistic idealized case. And showing an example here, is if we were to, if we utilize um, battery storage on site, we can actually cut off the peaks at an intermediate level, in this case, somewhere in the neighborhood of 900 kilowatts, where the grid would never be taxed beyond that 900 kilowatts. So we could save up to, you know, um, roughly 700 kilowatts of demand charges every month. And we could increase the, um, we, we could certainly smooth that power profile. And so the red line in the figure on the right would be the, the burden that would have to be handled by that on-site uh, battery system. And in the, um, like between days in this case, this is showing a week, a seven day week, um, when the power is below that limit, that's the opportunity where that large system battery could be recharged. And um, we're working on a program called Behind the Meter 
um, storage. And that's meant to be able to mitigate these fees um, using an optimized system, to maximize the economic benefit to the operator, considering the cost and lifetime of such a system. And those costs are ample as well. So they really have to be well planned and well designed um, to, give a, to give a predictable benefit. And then finally, coordination among dispensers and stations uh, can help as well. And I believe John Smart will update. We'll talk a lot about that in the next presentation. So another facet of fast charging is security. And that's one that people often don't think about. Um, with increasing station power, and more drivers relying on fast charging, um, the following factors um, can be vulnerabilities uh, that need to be addressed through cybersecurity R&D. So the first one's grid implications. And grid implications could be what could be done if somebody, a bad actor, were to uh, take control of several stations and do something as simple as um, power them all down or power them all up um, at once, which could, uh, on a feeder or some other uh, portion of the grid, it could be damaging um, compared to the way these stations would naturally operate. Um, in terms of safety, uh, generally the hardware is set up to make it very use for the uh, very safe for the user. But one example could be an exploit where um, you could trick the station into believing that it was cooler than it was or stopping the cooling pump. And you could actually raise the temperature of the charging handle or the cord, um, possibly to the point where it could be uncomfortable or could, could injure the user. Um, there's the possibility for, of hardware damage. Uh, simply, th this is a sophisticated machine with a lot of expensive, um, expensive and sophisticated parts, and um, that could be damaged. The theft of data is something that isn't often thought about, but vehicles could be tracked uh, by a hacker by looking at transaction IDs. One could follow um, a vehicle from station to state station, and um, that might seem, seem innocuous, but this data theft could be uh, even more problematic. And then finally, the simplest one is denial of service or, or be, being able to shut down the station or the payment methods such that the uh, user simply can't use the fast charging infrastructure, which would be, um, which is a way, th th there's already enough problems with reliability of some of the stations um, where we don't need any more um, inconvenience caused by that. And so cybersecurity is really a, an important aspect as well. So, so INL, just over a couple of mountains from Etons, is uh, working on several of these items in the energy storage and electric transportation department. We're, we're kind of broken out into three, uh, three groups. The infrastructure and energy storage group has the battery test center and the electric vehicle infrastructure lab. I have pictures of both of those. And in the electric vehicle infrastructure lab, we're doing testing on, um, we're utilizing a high powered 350 kilowatt station to test with some different vehicles and um, using that as a test bed for cybersecurity research. And in the battery test center, we're testing um, a lot of next gen battery chemistries and using those to feed into some of our mobility and data analytics projects, which include modeling and um, advanced analytic capabilities to understand how EVs, infrastructure and the grid uh, cooperate under a wide range of scenarios. And finally, the Energy Storage and Technology Group, um, they're working on developing next generation cell technologies, um, both materials and cell engineering with high energy density, a long life and safety, which are those keys for um, having safe, reliable, fast charge capable vehicles. And so in summary, um, vehicle batteries that can accept more miles per minute are key to really getting um, effective use of the XFC infrastructure. Uh, creative solutions are being developed for um, you know, charging these uh, big trucks. The business case where XFCs can be bolstered by minimizing um, the associated costs of uh, high demand on the grid. It's important to think about cybersecurity risks and design these stations to prevent exploits. And INL's research projects are broadly engaged in the future of fast charging.
So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take any questions. Thank you, Matt. That was very um, thorough and informative. Um, yeah. I, I have a, a quick question um, and everybody else can just pop in, but do you have an idea right, like how many vehicles on the market right now could accept um, extreme fast charging infrastructure? Um, I think that's something I could look up, but just offhand, are you aware? Yeah, so, so the good thing is any of the, any vehicle that utilizes the the CCS or the, um, well, of the different types, of the three different types, generally any of those vehicles can use the fast charging infrastructure that matches up to their standard. So even a, even a vehicle that is capable of only charging at like the lower charging power, like 50 kilowatts, they can still use a 350 kilowatt station. It'll just be limited to the, the car's acceptance. And so, the infrastructure rollout will still be accessible to them. They just can't lever. They just can't use all of the available power. And then um, there are very few vehicles, other than some exotics like um, I believe Porsches, that can take the very high power. Of course, Tesla is leading. Is kind of leading the charge too. I showed um, one of their high range model, long range Model Threes, uh, taking 250 kilowatts, but that um, just for a brief period. But a lot of the other vehicles that are coming out, even some offered by, um, I believe Hyundai, there's the Ionic. I think that vehicle is capable of doing more than 100 kilowatts, maybe even 200 some kilowatts. So they're coming, but um, a little bit slowly. And it's kind of this incremental march from 50 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts. Now we're starting to see the push towards hundreds of kilowatts, but it is, it is slow. So in terms of market share, I think it's very low. Mm -hmm. I have a couple more questions, but I'm going to let others pop in if they want. I'll read this comment from Natalie um, Bozeman. Uh, she said, this is really helpful, Matt. I'm grateful for INL. This is another EV startup that is claiming 300 miles of range in 15 minutes um, with a 1.5 megawatt fast charging station. So that's Atlas. Is that something you've heard of? I, I I have to admit my, um, my familiar <laughs> with, with my work having shifted away from as many vehicle um, evaluations in, in the recent past, I, I, I don't get my hands on as much of that. So I'm not familiar with them, but, but it's, always to, it's always important to want to wanna understand like what's, what's behind the, like you, you'd wanna ask the question, what is unique about um, their technology that uh, allows them to charge very fast like that? And, and certainly they, they, they could, could be doing that, but um, you know, generally, generally there are trade-offs. So to have very, very fast charging, you know, they might have to use a battery that um, is less energy dense. So it's a bigger battery that holds less energy. Sometimes that can um, be used to do really high powered charging. In fact, some of the buses that are meant to be charged on route using wireless charging or overhead charging um, use that type of battery system, whereas the long haul or over the road type vehicles tend to use a slower charging chemistry. So I would just ask um, ask about those things. What are what what are the trade offs, and what technology do they use to um, you know get those really impressive numbers? Are there other questions or comments? Here's another one. You might have shown this in the slide and I missed it, but do you have any insight into battery, battery degradation at the DCFC and XFC? How does that impact the lifetime of the battery and need to replace either for a passenger car or something like a transit bus? I mean. Yeah, so generally, um, let's start with the transit bus. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like sometimes the high power doesn't necessarily mean like fast. And so the battery degradation really is related to how fast. So don't worry so much about the, the power, but think if, it, if it's charging very fast, like 15 minutes or something like that, compared to an hour or hours, that's kind of the, the, the fast threshold. So a bus that might be able to take 150 kilowatts, um, it may be charged conveniently fast, maybe a matter of hours, 
but that's generally not stressful on the battery. Um, in a lot of electrochemical systems that we see in vehicles, um, charging in less than an hour can be considered kind of like, that's kind of the blurry line of fast charge where like a slow charge would be hours um, on out to sometimes a day for you know a very slow charge, like using the cord set in your vehicle trunk or something like that. And um, the amount of like, additional wear and tear over slow charging can be managed by uh, the vehicle thermal system. So how well the temperature can be maintained uh, throughout that pack is a really important aspect of that. Um, but generally for a vehicle to vehicle basis, it's best to, and I know this is just a canned answer, but it's best to look at, you know, what maintains the vehicle warranty because uh, the battery manufacturer and the vehicle manufacturer really probably have the by far the best set of data to know um, what kind of profiles or what percent of fast charging can be uh, tolerable and still make the vehicle last as long as it was intended. So I kind of would, would reference that material. Uh, Matt, I've got a question for you. This is Basil. Um, <clears throat> has there been any discussion among the vehicle manufacturers or, or or charging station manufacturers to treat future electric vehicles kind of like we treat a gas powered car. Because right now you pull into a fueling station, you have an empty tank and you just pick up the energy from the station. If you had a standardized battery solution uh, that you could just exchange batteries that were constantly being charged at this station, has is, is anything like that ever been discussed or brought up? Yeah, there was a, a company called um, Better Place um, going back almost 10 years ago, and I know that, that they had, um, I don't know if they are around anymore, but they had looked at that quite a bit. There have been others um, on a fleet basis, like keeping the assets within like the, the same ownership. You know, it might be feasible, but there's so many problems with, um, you know, it's almost like if you were just to, to swap your well cared for engine with, with someone else's, you know, not well cared for. And there, there are a lot of problems. Um, both logistically and technologically, that um, you have a lot of different power requirements for different classes of vehicles and things. So I can't say exactly what the what the nail in the coffin is for, for that proposed technology, but right now it, I don't think it's shaken out as feasible. Um, and if, if you were to have like a depot with a set of, let's say 100 buses for like a large Metro um, transit agency or something, that could that that might be more that might be more usable than having broadly exchanged energy storage among like a large group but but yeah i don't know any more than that right now yeah it sounds like it's a little too far too many problems to be under serious consideration i think so i think i think um a few companies have have tried that model but i don't think it's gotten too far off the ground okay thanks If nobody else is they're happy in, I'm gonna ask one more question. So you have here the business case for um, extreme fast charging can be bolstered um, with energy storage. Um, the, will you be providing that information in a, in a study? Because it just seems like energy storage would be mm -hmm. very expensive. It, I mean, obviously yeah. those demand charges are as well, but at what point does, does that make right. sense? <laughs> right, right, right. So there are a lot of moving pieces there that probably the biggest part, um, the biggest part is um, looking at your payback from saving those demand charges um, compared to the payoff of the capital cost of, I mean, this is kind of obvious, right? But the capital cost of the system, what I'm getting to is the capital cost of the system is really largely governed by the dollar per kilowatt hour of energy storage and the dollar per kilowatt of the power conversion system, because not only do we have to take the, um, <clears throat> the type of power, so usually 480 volt DC, uh, AC uh, three phase power, and then convert that into DC power that can be stored in the batteries and then turn it back around when it's needed to feed the fast chargers. Um, the power conversion hardware, like your inverters and things, those are also um, a large cost in dollars per kilowatt. So how much power is being handled by that battery system? And then almost, and also the energy that's needed to keep it from being 
overly depleted throughout the day or throughout the week, um, those two factors come in. And it very much varies from site to site, <clears throat> both with um, how it would be used in the present and then also how it is expected to be used over its lifetime. <clears throat> and then the uh, life of the batteries and the life of that power conversion system matter very much as well. So that beyond the meter storage or it's BTMS is the acronym. That one is working on <clears throat> putting together uh, cost targets and um, you know gen general targets that would achieve economic viability for, for mostly for enabling fast charging of, of light duty, medium, or, or even heavy duty vehicles. And so that is a multi-year program that's ongoing at DOE. Um, and they're working on also looking at what gaps there are for developing batteries that aren't so much special, specialized for you know, vehicle battery packs, but stationary. So perhaps they can be heavier or take up more volume, but they can cost less and have longer lifespans and things like that. So the trade-offs are different, the targets are different, and um, <clears throat> that BTMS program is working on both of those things. Okay, a lot of, a lot of factors into that. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely a lot of that. <laughs> well, I, I don't hear anybody jumping in with questions. So I think we'll, we'll end here with your presentation. Um, and we 